Okay. Thanks, Tal. I guess uh, this is uh, the natural stopping point. But, uh, okay, so I guess I'm uh, the only thing standing between you and the next decade. <laughs> it feels a bit like uh, being in front of a very long line, uh, so it's tempting to continue, but I'll try to be considerate and end the talk uh, this decade. So uh, <laughs> please stop me, Tal, uh, when it's time. Okay, so I'll talk about homomorphic secret sharing. And this is a, a survey uh, of a line of work um, on two very related notions, homomorphic secret sharing and a dual notion called function secret sharing that I'll explain. Uh, I've mostly engaged in this line of work with uh, Elet and uh, Niv, and, uh, but recently also with Rachel, Stefano, Geoffroy, Lisa, and two Peters. So this will be a, a survey of, of quite a lot of work that we've done uh, since 2015. Okay, so I'll introduce the notions and then I'll talk uh, about applications, both in cryptography and in complexity theory. And finally, I'll conclude with the uh, constructions. Great, so uh, just a brief recap. Uh, I uh, guess uh, most of us attended Shai's talk. So in fully homomorphic encryption, uh, this was like a holy grail uh, for 30 years since the problem was introduced and it was uh, the first candidate was proposing the breakthrough result of uh, Gentry. So here we take uh, an input, we encrypt it, and we can magically homomorphically evaluate uh, any function we want on the encrypted input and get a short encrypted output which we can decrypt using a secret key. Okay, so that's fully homomorphic encryption. Uh, just to zoom in on this evaluation function, you can think of it as a, an efficient uh, algorithm that takes both an encrypted input and a description of a function f and produces an encrypted output. Uh, for our purposes, uh, representations matter. So typically when you talk about FHE, you think of the function as being represented by a circuit which captures all polynomial time computations. For the purpose of this talk, I will also be interested in weaker representations like branching programs that capture a uh, log space. It's kind of related to Shai's uh, automata example. And sometimes uh, we'll talk about uh, multivariate polynomials represented as a sum of monomials and will go as low as point functions, which are functions that evaluate, that have a non-zero value on at most one input, but possibly from an exponentially big domain. Okay, so these are the types of representations of functions that uh, will play a role in this talk. Okay, so where do we stand? Uh, we, we heard uh, uh, earlier today about uh, really cutting edge research in this area. Uh, there is a huge impact both on theory and also a lot of uh, interest in industry and startups and so on. So it's a huge success story. Uh, we, we now, uh, if Gentry's original paper, the assumptions were kind of shaky, now uh, we have a pretty solid uh, understanding of the assumptions or uh, uh, we can base it on uh, standard assumptions like LWE with possibly with some additional uh, circular security assumption if we want the strongest version. And there's really a lot of work on improving the efficiency of FHE. So we, we got some examples uh, from Chai's talk, but there, there are many different settings and many different types of computations that people try to optimize. And uh, I would say that for general computations, we can currently do maybe 100 bit operations per second. That's the ballpark. But for special types of computations, like the ones Chai talked about, uh, we can have much faster FHE implementation. So it's great. On the other hand, uh, from a theory perspective, we still have a very narrow set of assumptions that are all related to lattices. So if you find, uh, say, polynomial time algorithm to the SVP problem, then all candidates, uh, what? Yeah, well, possibly, I'm not sure. Yeah, and, and this is not only about assumptions, it's not only about proving things. So even in terms of heuristic constructions, we don't really have constructions that avoid this dependence on lattices. So you can, if you want a formal question that captures what the structure means, think of a generic group, right? A generic group is just a, think of a group with exponentially many elements that are assigned random labels and you can sample random group elements and perform the group operations in a blind way. So 
you, you're given a black box access to the group. In this setting, we can implement in an information theoretic sense, PKE and even secure computation, but we don't know. It's an open question whether in this model we can get information theoretic FHD. So this dependence on lattices, again, it's not so bad. On the other hand, it does have also impact on uh, efficiency because the lattices are subject to attacks like LLL algorithm and other attacks. And this means that uh, there is still a lot of room for improvement in terms of concrete efficiency, especially if you want to do, say, encrypt a single bit, right? Or you get a single encrypted bit. We saw in Shai's talk numbers like 50 gigabytes, right? This is some kind of a partially at least an artifact of lattice attacks. If we didn't have, a, you know, if LLL did not exist, we would have much better numbers. Great, so what I'll talk about is something that uh, is mainly a relaxation of uh, FHE, but also in some way a strengthening of FHE. So this is the FHE picture, and now uh, you can think of what uh, I'll describe now as relating to Shai's talk in the same way pretty much as Moni and Yael's talks uh, referred to Jens's talk, right? So it's uh, some distributed version of FHE, where instead of having a single ciphertext, now we can have two shares that each of them individually hides the input in a computational sense. And we have this eval algorithm that takes a function f and is run locally on each of the two shares, so there is no interaction. You can think of these two shares as being uh, sent to two different parties, so each of these parties computes locally a share of the output. And we make the following strong requirement that the decoding of the output has to be done by XOR or more generally by addition over a finite group. Why do we make this requirement? Because we can and because it's important. We can in the sense that all of the constructions we have can be made to satisfy it. And it's important for several applications that I'll mention in the talk. So you could consider other notions and I'll talk about it soon. But just a, a brief comparison, so here, um, I guess the big, maybe the only downside conceptually is that here we need to assume that we have these two non-colluding parties. If you combine x1 and x2, you can easily recover x. On the other hand, this is sometimes not an issue. You'll see some applications where this doesn't change anything in terms of the security that you get, but very often it is an issue. On the other hand, we do get some advantages. So we get this very simple decoding, this optimal compactness. So think of f as a Boolean function that outputs just one bit. Each output share is a single bit. You XOR it, right? You cannot hope for something like this in encryption. Here you need an actual ciphertext, OK? Uh, so we get this maximal level of compactness. And also, it's a keyless primitive. Of course, you can take an FHE and force it into this setting. but Typically, generically, it will not give you this very simple and compact uh, output representation. And the main hope uh, behind this, uh, uh, this alternative model is that we can uh, avoid uh, the main disadvantages of FHE. We can diversify assumptions and get, at least in some useful cases, a much better efficiency. OK, any questions about uh, the model? Okay, so there are several things that are arbitrary about this definition, and indeed uh, you can look uh, also, there are different notions of HSS or generalized versions of HSS that uh, are implicit in the literature. Uh, you can look at this uh, ITCS 18 paper for, for a taxonomy and pointers to the literature, but you can generalize uh, in several natural ways. You can consider more than uh, two parties. You can consider sec relaxed security against T non-colluding, at least against T colluding parties. Uh, you can uh, talk about information theoretic HSS, uh, which can be perfectly secure. You can uh, relax the decoding, just insist on compactness, but not on uh, additive decoding, or you can even relax compactness to partial compactness. There are all these things are not hypothetical. They're natural examples or natural settings where we can only achieve uh, each, each uh, say, partial compactness. And you can also consider multi-input versions where you can compute jointly on inputs that are shared by different users. 
Okay, so for the purpose of this talk, we go back to this simple default case, uh, you know, two parties, computational security, it's kind of inherent in this setting if you want to do uh, non-trivial things. And uh, yeah, so this is the setting we consider in this talk, yes. Yeah, partial could be like a square root n of uh, the input size. Or square root, yeah. Yeah, or just the uh, same as input size but independent on the function description size, things like this. So there are natural examples where we can only achieve this. Okay, so here's uh, basically capturing the current state of the art of what we know. As you see, there is a much richer interplay between uh, the type of assumptions we make and the type of uh, functionality or representation classes we can handle. So this is like a version of Impagliazzo's famous worlds, uh, ranging from algorithmica, where basically there is no average case hardness, to uh, this is uh, some kind of an ad hoc world gentry, a world where FHE exists or current constructions of FHE are secure, it's not uh, totally generic. So if you go to the bottom, uh, you know, if you use the simple additive secret sharing, um, this, this uh, is actually quite useful. Uh, additive secret sharing allows you to compute linear function. You know, if you take a vector of numbers and you secret share every entry additively between two parties, these two parties can compute locally just any linear function of the shared vector. Okay, this is very simple and this doesn't require any assumptions. But if you want to go even a little bit above it, uh, say to point functions, then you already need one-way functions and it turns out that one-way functions are also sufficient. Okay, and this is in Minicrypt. Uh, if we go all the way uh, to FHE style, uh, constructions, then you can modify existing. It's not a generic thing. We cannot take a general FHE. We don't know how to take a general FHE and convert it into a general HSS because of this additive uh, decoding requirement. But we can take existing constructions, and I'll say a bit about it later, and modify them in a simple way uh, to get uh, similar HSS schemes uh, that have this additive decoding. Uh, something that's much more surprising uh, is this intermediate world uh, that looks at these uh, classical uh, 20th century assumptions, you know, DDH and Paye, and obtains HSS uh, for branching programs. Okay, these, are th these, these constructions are the mo also the most, uh, I would say, well separated from other things we know. And we can also use LWE uh, to use the same blueprint that you use for DDH and PIA in a non-trivial way and get a simpler and more efficient HSS under LWE than what you would get by using existing uh, flavors of FHE. And finally, we have this, okay, in, I should say that in this uh, low end, uh, it's more convenient both for stating the results and for some of the applications to look at the dual notion that we call function secret sharing and there, we just reverse the role of the input and the function. So there you share a function f into two succinctly described f1 and f2. And eval takes an input x and returns, uh, you know, shares of the output. So it's more convenient uh, to think of uh, splitting, say, a point function or an interval function or a decision tree. If you try to reverse it around, you'll get something that's not natural. Okay, and also some applications uh, are more conveniently cut using this formulation. Okay, so uh, I going back to this mini crypt world, uh, we have very good concrete efficiency for these constructions. Um, you know, just to, to give you some numbers, you know, if the point has 128 bits of input, you can do um, uh, basically 10,000 bits for each share of this point function <laughs> and you can evaluate something like uh, 200 uh, million times on different points uh, per second. It's very, very fast. Okay, and here you have a hole, and this hole is uh, filled by a recent uh, discovery that you can use uh, assumptions uh, similar to the learning parity with noise assumption, even in parameter regime, which is not known to imply public encryption. So it's somewhere between mini crypt and cryptomania. We call it Lapland. 
right? <laughs> the only, the closest name of the country that uh, to LPN. And, uh, and here we can, what we currently can do is evaluate constant degree multivariate polynomials. Okay, so now all of these uh, representations that I mentioned before made an appearance, so now uh, you can forget about it for, for a while. Okay, so this is where we stand, and I think uh, there's a lot uh, more we don't know. So it's, it's uh, certainly from LPN, uh, I doubt uh, that this is the end of it. Okay, so the rest of the talk, uh, I'll talk about applications and constructions. Uh, let me start with applications. So let's start by looking at these uh, classical or traditional uh, applications of FHE and see how they work with HSS. So the first scenario is that I'm a weak client or I don't want to store my data. I pick a secret key and I encrypt uh, my data X uh, on the cloud. Think of this as my calendar. Okay, I want to encrypt it because I don't want uh, the cloud uh, server to know my calendar. Okay, you can think of any other information, my emails, anything else. Now when I want to check, uh, okay, now do I have a meeting, uh, you know, the server knows the time or you can even encrypt the query and the, quer and the server sends you an encrypted answer. Yes, you have a meeting. Or no, you don't have a meeting. And you can decrypt it and get the answer. Okay, the nice thing is that you only have to store a short key. You don't need to store your data. You can access your data from multiple devices and so on. We're all used to working uh, with data in the cloud except that we usually don't encrypt it. Or if we encrypt it, we don't search it. Or if we search it, it's not secure. <laughs> 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 okay, <laughs> good. So in HSS you have the same, except that you need two cloud servers and you need to trust that they don't collude. Okay, so you pick your two servers that you trust that they don't collude or that there is a low probability of them colluding. It's a, it's a weaker and less desirable trust model. Uh, however, we get the benefits of the uh, HSS that I mentioned before. Some of them are, are hypothetical, but something that's by definition that's not hypothetical is that from the client's perspective, things are very easy. No need to remember keys or to worry about the keys being stolen. Um, you know, you have to know if you n now have a meeting or not, you get a one bit from each server and you XOR them. In the FHE solution, Shai, would this be 50 megabytes? So maybe it's you improve it by a factor of 100, it's still pretty big. And if you want, uh, if you have a very busy schedule, right, like deadline every five seconds, then uh, you can get, you can stream your data and get real-time information, just one bit per time period, per second, whereas with FHE, you'll have to get a very long, even if you ignore the computation on the server side, just the communication, to get an FHE ciphertext every second, this is not uh, very good. So FHE is very good in an amortized sense, but if you want to encrypt a single bit, it's not good, as we saw in Shai's talk. I mean, it's great, but not as good as we could hope for. Cool, so now you can consider a dual setting where, I mean, before you thought of a big amount of data being uh, uploaded to the cloud, uh, secret data. Now think of a small amount of secret data and a big amount of public data. So think of the cloud as having uh, some database, a stock quote or geographical or map or something, which is not confidential or news feeds. And now you want to encrypt a query saying, say, a list of keywords and you want to be alerted when there is some news feed that contains your keywords. Okay, it's the type of things we search for or some stock that you want to follow. <laughs> right, so you can use FHE to encrypt your query and then you can get back an encrypted answer. And here again, this is, this is a short, it's kind of dual in terms of what's big and what's small. And here, um, you know, you split it between two servers as before, and again, the same advantages on the client side, and think of streaming data, searching, streaming news feeds, streaming stock quotes, and so on. And it's interesting that this uh, idea was put forth uh, of distributing, uh, you know, uh, these secure searches in the context of a private information retrieval in the 90s, and, uh, you know, 20 years later, there have been quite a lot of implementations, but one that specifically used simple forms of HSS, like mini-crypt types of HSS, is a splinter, which was a system which is built around this architecture and allows you to do things like uh, search uh, restaurants near me. Okay, so you can do pretty expressive searches using this type of uh, 
a symmetric crypto HSS in a much faster way than you could using, say, existing FAT schemes. Okay, and finally, you can even upload, right? You can do these secure updates, right? You can think of, a, uh, think of some encrypted uh, file server. You encrypt your files. Now you want to do some edit. You encrypt the delta, and this is homomorphically updated on the server side. And in HSS, again, the advantage is that it has this simpler additive XOR representation of your, uh, of your data, and uh, it works uh, well with multiple users who update the data, no key management, and everybody can uh, decode it. You don't need to get an input, the, the secret key. You can access your data in the clear and so on. So it's very convenient for these purposes, and indeed in the 90s we had uh, this uh, architecture being uh, proposed in the context of uh, private information storage, the writing version of PIR, and uh, we've had uh, implementations, uh, specifically this is one of them, uh, the repo system, it's a system that implements uh, anonymous messaging by having a many different clients uh, basically write their message in a random location of a big array, uh, which effectively mixes the messages and hides the identity of who sent which message. Okay, so these are all uh, examples of use cases where you could use FHE, but uh, HSS gives you some uh, advantages and certainly diversifies the type of solutions you can use. At the expense of a uh, an inferior trust model, even though in the multi-user case there is a question of where the keys are held. So in the multi-user case of FHE, the trust model is the same. Okay, so can we use, but here it's always about one client, two servers. This is not the standard uh, model for MPC, right? Think of secure two-party computation, the simplest, uh, the most classical uh, model for MPC, or even uh, honest majority MPC, it doesn't matter. So we have these three different approaches to secure multi-party computation. One due to Yao based on garbled circuits. One where the data is being secret shared using some linear additive or Shamir, right, depending on two-party settings versus honest majority setting. And then you use something like oblivious transfer in, in the case of no honest majority to move from a, you know, secret shared uh, inputs of a gate to secret shared outputs. So you basically consume, if you want to do secure two-party computation using this GMW approach, you consume a couple of oblivious transfers, bit oblivious transfers per end gate. XOR <coughs> gates are for free. And finally, we have this uh, more recent approach which uses fully homomorphic encryption to implement secure computation. The big advantage of this approach over all previous approaches is that the communication complexity is roughly input size plus output size, whereas both the garbled circuits and linear secret sharing approaches uh, require the communication complexity to be bigger than the size of a circuit you're computing. Okay, so this was a major breakthrough in, in the area, and in general, uh, you know, the, the gap between communication complexity of secure computation and insecure computation was made much, much smaller using FHE. So luckily we have an empty spot here, right? Uh, this was just, uh, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, it's more tricky to draw with just uh, three. So I, uh, you know, I, I dumped a few uh, better approaches just to make it. Uh. <laughs> okay, so this is the new kid on the of the block, of the MPC block. So it turns out you can use a uh, homomorphic secret sharing even for just the basic uh, model say of secure two-party computation or in any model of secure two-party computation, you can use HSS both in a stand as a standalone primitive, and we'll explain how this is done, and also as a tool to enhance the efficiency of uh, these top two approaches. So it does not enhance efficiency of fully homomorphic encryption. We don't have any application in this direction, only in the other direction. But uh, we can, uh, as I will explain, we can get uh, significant efficiency gains for the traditional approaches if we use certain kinds of uh, HSS. Cool. So let me show how uh, we can use HSS in the setting, again, the standard setting of secure two-party computation. And our goal is to get succinctness, namely that communication will be roughly the input size as opposed to the circuit size. 
So with, a, with FHA, it seems totally straightforward. So one party sends the encrypted input to the second, and the second sends an encrypted output to the first, and the encrypted output is decrypted. This is how it works. This is how you can use FHE to get secure computation where the communication complexity is comparable to the input side. How do we do it with HSS? It seems uh, more challenging, right? So the key observation is that we can use any of the classical methods, Yao, you know, the garble circuits or linear secret sharing to emulate a dealer that concatenates the two inputs and then applies the HSS share function to the concatenated input, right? So this is an interactive protocol that results in a homomorphic secret sharing of the combined inputs, A and B. Okay, the, compl the communication complexity of this protocol is comparable to the input size because the HSS uh, circuit size, the sharing uh, can be made uh, nearly linear, okay? So this is certainly independent of the circuit size because it only depends on the input and not on what we're computing. Now that we know what we want to compute, we can apply this local evaluation. We get these additive shares of the output, and because they're additive, it's okay to just uh, send one share. You don't need to apply another MPC to do the decoding. Okay, so this is how you use HSS, and this seems terribly complicated, right? Especially this uh, distributing uh, this input generation, but it turns out that uh, this can be done uh, much better using special purpose techniques. Uh, we, we have uh, these bonus features of, uh, you know, if you have the, these inputs and you want to compute many small functions, say one by one, so the amortization f benefits of FHE do not kick in if you want to compute many sequence of functions with small output, and with HSS you can get much better communication in this setting. And this too has been implemented. Uh, this is uh, some form of a distributed RAM program uh, by Donner and Shalat, uh, which basically uses uh, HSS in Minicrypt to implement a simple uh, table lookup. Uh, you can think of it as PIR or PIR writing, where the input is uh, distributed between two parties, the secret uh, location that you want to read or write to. And it turns out that this can be done uh, using a very fast special purpose protocol, much better than ri running a generic uh, protocol to distribute this shared generation part. Good, so uh, let me describe a more recent application and a less uh, obvious one. So this is again a feature of this additive representation of the output. So this is uh, what uh, the second bullet here refers to we can basically distribute a, a computation that generates some long correlated vector. Think of, say, vectors of uh, many AIs, BIs, and CIs, where the AI and BI are random, and CI is AI times BI. This is known as multiplication triple. Okay, you can generate, you can use a standard cryptographic pseudo-random generator to expand the small randomness, say the XOR of contributions of the two parties into big randomness and then use this big randomness to generate this structured randomness, these triples. And now you stop before the final step. So now you get this additive secret sharing of this structured randomness, okay, this structured correlated randomness. Why is this useful? Well, this is useful because there are many cryptographic applications that can benefit by orders of magnitude if you have the right form of correlated randomness. In fact, all of uh, everybody who learned the crypto class knows that if we have, you know, if Ellie and I have the same long random secret string, then I can send Ellie an encrypted message much in a much simpler and more efficient way than using alternative approaches, okay? So this is a simple case of correlated randomness, but it turns out that in the same way that you can use a one-time pad for secure communication, you can use things like oblivious transfer correlations or beaver triples, multiplication triples that I mentioned before for secure computation. So with the right type of correlated randomness, let's say a sequence of a random oblivious transfers, you have a long sequence of random oblivious transfers that is <coughs> shared between uh, two parties. Now they can compute any Boolean circuit using computational cost, which is only a small constant factor bigger 
then evaluating the circuit in the clear. So the cost of secure computation from the computation point of view is only a small constant factor given the right kind of correlated randomness. So if you have a very fast network, you can think of a really secure computation as being essentially for free given the right kind of correlated randomness. But the main challenge is to generate this correlated randomness securely, right? It's not uh, like, a, even if we have a secure communication channel, how do we secreture A, B, and C such that C is A times B? This requires secure computation. So it turns out that uh, you can do it using HSS, at least for the a useful kind of correlations that we call additive. And additive correlation is an additive secret sharing of some structured randomness. Okay, so pseudo -random correlation, correlated pseudo-random correlation generator, or PCG, you can think of it as a distributed version of standard PRG. It takes a pair of short correlated seeds and allows each party to deterministically expand its seed to a long piece of correlated randomness, such that these two big pieces, they satisfy, they conform to some target correlation, say these multiplication, a bunch of multiplication triples or a bunch of random oblivious transfers. And to make this non-trivial and useful, we need it to be the case that from this seed alone, you don't learn more about the second output than what you can legitimately learn using your output. Okay, so this ensures that you can use it securely, that you need to rely on this secrecy part of the correlated randomness for this to be useful. Okay, so you can look at the useful correlations that have been used uh, for a while in the MPC literature and are used in actual products or protocols that people implement. You can use oblivious transfer correlations, you can use something known as truth table correlations, oblivious linear function evaluation, authenticated versions of the multiplication triples, this gives you security against malicious parties essentially for free. All these correlations conform to this additive requirement, which as I explained, you can build in principle using homomorphic secret sharing. Just by sharing a seed to a standard PRG and homomorphically evaluating the function that expands the seed, and then generates the structured randomness and the output is additively shared by definition of HSS. Okay, and so this seems crazy if you try to do it generically, but it turns out, and hopefully I'll get to talk about it, that we can get very good concrete efficiency for useful correlations like OT and truth tables, and we're working on getting also good concrete efficiency for the other types of correlations. So this is really a, an area where we have a lot of progress. So this naturally gives rise to this paradigm that uh, I think can be very useful for practical secure computation, which we call secure computation with silent preprocessing. <coughs> so normally uh, in actual <coughs> protocols like SPEEDS protocol, you do a lot of interaction to generate correlated randomness, you know, and then maybe you don't use it, or maybe you don't want to reveal it. It's a lot of work, a lot of computation, a lot of communication for generating a lot of correlated randomness with each party that you want to interact with. Here we have this uh, silent version where the offline part before the inputs are known is broken into two parts. There is a first uh, like a exchanging a business card part where we engage in a small amount of interaction just to generate these correlated seeds for the PCG. And then, and then you can wait. And now, uh, you know, uh, I, call, uh, I call Shai up and I tell him, hey, let's do some secure computation, big secure computation tomorrow or in an hour. And now we can do this silent part, we, we just do this uh, local expansion part of the PCG without talking to each other. And now we generate these one-time pads for secure computation that we exploit in the online phase once the inputs are known. Okay, so this is a very useful paradigm because existing practical protocols, they already use this offline online uh, part, except that the offline part involves a lot of communication that you need to spend in any case, and here you can just do this very little communication. So even if you look at, uh, this is just some concrete numbers in t the of an actual implementation, uh, if you use this paradigm, suppose I don't care about this silent feature, okay? Just look at the total cost of running everything, right? So, right, so the first phase will cost you something like 100 kilobytes, 
so let's let's talk about uh, evaluating a circuit with five million end gates and any number of XOR gates, okay, not gates. Okay, so we have this setup that involves just a hundred kilobytes of communication, and even you can do it with two rounds. Now we have this silent seed expansion, which this is standard hardware, and again, a lot of room for improvement. Uh, it takes less than three seconds to generate 10 million random OT correlations, and then you can consume them using this GMW protocol, and you only communicate four bits per end gate. So this, is the, this dominates the total communication cost. And if we look at the uh, practical approaches that uses, use uh, like uh, this IKMP OT extension to generate OTs, they need uh, 100 times more the communication, roughly 400 bits per end gate. So that's a major savings, uh, which applies even if you don't care about this silent feature, just in terms of total cost. And there is a lot of room. Uh, so I should say that in terms of computation, uh, this type of silent OT extension, right now it's four times more computation intensive than uh, IKMP but it's, si it's silent computation, so you can do it locally, three seconds, so, you know, who cares? And also there's a lot of room for improvement. Okay, so, good. So let me tell you another recent application that where it's more convenient to use this dual uh, function secret sharing formulation where you split a function into two parts. <coughs> this is a very simple and, and quite a powerful approach uh, for handling uh, exotic types of gates uh, using preprocessing. So again, preprocessing is correlated <coughs> randomness that does not depend on the input. Okay, so you can consider a circuit that consists of, uh, say, gates that uh, multiply big numbers, and then some gates do things like ReLU or zero test, or compare which of two numbers is bigger, or split a big number into bits. These are very, very common. And the question is, how can we compute such circuits using correlated randomness in a way <coughs> that would minimize the online cost once the inputs are known. And it turns out that function secret sharing gives you just the right primitive for this that in a sense generalizes existing protocols but also instantiates them in, in useful ways. So the idea is very simple. The dealer that generates the cor correlated randomness will pick a random mask Ri. So think of every wire as living in some abelian group. So for each wire you associate a random element of this group and each party gets the masks of its own, the input wires that, belongs to this, that belong to this party. And you reveal the masks of the output wires in the clear because this has to be unmasked in the end. And now you need to maintain the invariant that you want to reveal the mask value of every wire. Okay, so this is very easy for the inputs because every party was given by the dealer the mask of his inputs. So this is easily done at the input level. You reveal, both parties now know, it can work for many parties, but let's say two parties, each of them knows the mask value of these input wires. And now the question is how to move from mask values of the input for G to mask value of the output of G. And it turns out that there is a very simple function related to G that if you split it additively between the two parties, you get it almost immediately. So if you can split additively this offset function that takes W prime one, W prime two, unmask the input and then adds this output mask, if you split it between the two parties, you know, we don't want, we cannot reveal to each of the party the mask, right? This will destroy everything. But we can split the function additively into two functions that add to the function, then every party can locally evaluate his share of the function. And then they exchange the output shares and they just get the masked output wire. Okay, so this is very simple, and uh, the challenge here is to, ev to implement this function secret sharing for the offset classes that are, induces by, are induced by gates that we want to compute, right? So if we want to compute a ReLU gate, it induces some offset class of functions that has many functions, right? They're defined by the input mass and the output mass. It defines a class of functions. We need to hide which function we're sharing, and this is exactly done by function secret sharing, and luckily it turns out that for useful, this is the information theoretic domain, this is recasting existing protocols due to Beaver and Damgard et al and so on. You can take existing protocols and recast them as instances of this FSS framework that are information theoretic. So you can take uh, 
say multiplication, if you have a multiplication gate, then the offset class is a degree two polynomials in two variables. And now you can just additively share the four coefficients and you get FSS for the class of these polynomials. So this is simple and information theoretic. But it turns out that we can use these HSS in Minicrypt to evaluate all these very useful things like zero test, comparison, um, you know, millionaire's problem, a ReLU, bit decomposition, spline functions. So most of the useful nonlinear functions, luckily the offset functions happen to coincide with things we can do in Minicrypt, which are very practical and efficient. So just to compare with the garbled circuit approach, which is normally used to do these things in the offline online model, we get 100 times less online communication because with garbled circuits you have to communicate a key for each input bit. Half the number of rounds and similar storage in online computation. The only downside is that it's more tricky to generate these correlated randomness. For this we don't have yet PCGs. <coughs> cool, so how much time do I have? Good, so let me briefly mention a complexity theoretic application. So we have this notion of a locally random reduction where we split we reduce the function f to a function g by mapping an input x for f. Think of it as a Boolean function representing a language. We, we map it into multiple inputs such that each input individually looks random or at least is distributed independently of x. And we want this part, splitting part to be efficient and the, this decoding part to be efficient. That's the notion of locally random reduction. Uh, it has two kinds of applications, worst case to average case reductions. Uh, it's very related to locally decodable codes and program checking. Um, the textbook construction uh, uses, uh, this is the first uh, example of, of use of arithmetization in, in, in computer science. Uh, the textbook example just uses the multilinear extension of the function and it can be viewed as a homomorphic secret sharing for multivariate polynomial where the number of shares is equal to the degree and t is one. Okay, this, this can be formulated as an information theoretic uh, HSS for low degree polynomials. And you know, so there are two main drawbacks of this. First is that we need many instances roughly like the length of x. And second, uh, while it works well, and these were the original complexity theoretic applications, if f is, if the function f uh, is already very hard, say complete in p space or x time, then g will be in the same complexity class, or maybe g can even be equal to f. However, if you look at function f, which is polynomial time, or even something as simple as a DNF formula, then uh, this extension g will be sharply complete. So. It works well at the high end of complexity classes, but not for poly time. And HSS gives you this dream version of uh, locally random reductions where you have just two inputs, each of them is pseudo random, and now you have one bit, right? You can apply it to languages. So these are, this is a different language G, you reduce F to G, you reduce a single instance of language X to two instances of language G. And you can use it to actually get, and, and this works for polynomial time, and the time of G is comparable to the time of F. G is just the evaluation function of the HSS and only two instances, and you can actually apply it. Uh, so, so there are other approaches, like Chang, Kalai, and Vadhan suggested using FHE uh, for similar purposes, but there you have the disadvantage of a long output. Here you just have two bits. It works for languages. So you can apply to get uh, program checkers or proof systems that have, I will not go over it, uh, even though it's a fun example, that they basically have, they will basically have uh, features that we don't know how to achieve by other means. So we can get, following some reusable preprocessing, we can get with just reading two bits, you cannot get it with PCPs, uh, you can get uh, arbitrary inverse polynomial soundness error. What? Yeah, it's, it's just using the classical approach. Okay. The picture, it's basically some, uh, you know, Messi wants to run some algorithm that will decide if the goalie in a penalty kick uh, jumps to the left or to the right, but the only manufacturer is Brazilian and so on. <laughs> so you basically want to, you can't test this hardware on random inputs because in the moment of truth, uh, the Brazilian goalie will wink in a special way and will make the hardware fail. Good, that's the short version. Okay, so rest of talk is non-existent. I will just, uh, let me just jump directly to the very simple uh, two minutes. 
to tell you about these very simple new constructions for HSS for polynomials, which also drive silent OT and these other PCGs that I mentioned. The idea is very simple. The dual version of the standard learning parity with noise assumption says that if you take a sparse vector and you compress it by a random matrix, or even uh, you, know, you can assume it for a specific matrix, you get something that looks pseudo-random, okay? This is exactly equivalent to the standard version like you know, the Dregenford of LWE, uh, except that the noise distribution is different. It's low humming weight instead of low L2 norm or Gaussian. Okay, this is as conservative, I think most people would agree that this is as conservative as LWE or maybe even more conservative in some sense, but that's debatable. Okay, so now, uh, and this is basically pseudo-random assuming that LPN holds for the dual code, the code whose parity check matrix is H. Okay, this is why it's a dual version of LPN. It's not the standard formulation. And now it's very simple. I will show you how, okay, I will just uh, uh, show you this. I will show you how to compress additive shares of a random, a long random vector R, and now this is R tensored with R. If you can do this, because it's additive secret sharing, you can basically take any correlation that is generated by degree two polynomials, right, without interacting. So I'll just show you how to compress this specific degree two correlation, a long random vector, and this random vector tensored with itself, meaning all combinations of Ri times Rj. It's kind of like the Beaver triples correlation. Okay, so the idea is to first do it for sparse vectors. Sparse vectors meaning they have a small number of non-zero entries. If I take a random sparse S, then S tensored with S will al also be sparse. So if this is like, a, I don't know, 20, this will have 400 non-zero entries. And now we can use this mini-crypt HSS to compress additive secret sharing of sparse vectors. Okay, so we solve the problem, except that these vectors are not random and not even pseudo-random, they're sparse. We cannot use it. To make use of it, we need to apply this uh, LPN assumption and compress it using an LPN-friendly mapping, and we can apply some tensoring of this mapping to get uh, a, this correlation that we want. There are many ways in which you can optimize it to get OT correlations. You can avoid this quadratic blow-up and so on, and this is basically a work in progress and you can easily move from PCG for degree t two uh, correlations to HSS for degree uh, two correlations. This is easy. So let me just jump to the end. So, so thanks for being patient. Uh, I just want to uh, mention uh, a couple of uh, open questions and, and, and uh, do some plug for a talk uh, on Friday by Ohad Klein. So Ohad, le let me just uh, mention that uh, the part that I did not cover, this. Uh, a group-based or DDH-based construction. It involves some uh, interesting notion of distributed discrete log. And there is a really beautiful work of Dinur, Keller, and Klein from Last Crypto that uh, gets an optimal protocol in some sense. It's a quadratic improvement over what uh, we had uh, in our work uh, with, with the letter NIV. And we have a follow-up uh, work that has uh, algorithmic applications of this cryptographic result. So it's a result uh, about groups. It's something that breaks down if quantum computers, like it's totally useless from a crypto perspective if quantum computers exist, yet this is an algorithmic application that is independently interested, interesting and Ohad Klein will talk about it uh, on Friday. So thanks. <laughs>